Dr. Lauren Lownan, and this is a short set of video lectures on the use of chi-square goodness of fit test in simple Mendelian genetics problems. This, um, my voice sounds a little rough, and I'm going to pause the video from time to time because I'm recovering from a bit of a, of a bout with a respiratory virus, so I apologize for, for that. So we've been working in a class on Mendelian genetics, on Mendelian genetic problems, monohybrid crosses, dihybrid crosses, and the like. And if you were working in a system, a Mendelian, and by system I mean you're studying the inheritance of a Mendelian trait, something that shows Mendelian patterns in, in uh, inheritance, then uh, as a scientist you would develop an experimental hypothesis, which is a stated explanation of what's going on genetically in your in your organism and with the trait that you're studying. And you might word something like this. You might say plant height is controlled by a single gene referred to as the A gene, where big A is dominant and associated with short plants, and little a is recessive and associated with tall plants. There's your experimental hypothesis. And how might you test it? Well, you could do some good old-fashioned Mendelian genetics. Start off with true parental organisms, big A, big A, and little a, little a, mate them, and out of that you would get F1 that would be big A, little a. Or so you would be assuming if you're experimental hypothesis was true. Let them self or mate together and look at the F2 and you should see a 3 to 1 phenotype ratio. Or take that presumed heterozygote, or several of them of course, and do what's called a test cross where you mate that big A little a organism, the thing that you're assuming is a heterozygote, with a tester, a homozygous recessive organism. And in that case the test cross progeny should occur in a one-to-one -one phenotype ratio, tall plants and uh, short plants. All right, let's say you do that test cross experiment, and you get 200 offspring in the test cross, and 100 of them are short, and 100 of them are tall. Well, wow, that's pretty fantastic, right? You couldn't have planned that data any better, because if you had 200 progeny and you split them up, 100 and 100 is actually textbook perfect data. Seriously, in life, you just never get data that's that perfect, right? Because there's always fluctuation due to due fluctuations in any system due to chance alone, especially complex systems like living organisms. So instead, you're more likely to have gotten a data set that maybe it's closer of you know than than I'm showing you here. Like maybe it's like 99 and 101 or something like that, right? But you might get data that looks like this, where it's as much as a 25 plant um, difference between what you um, predicted or expected and what you observed. So what do you make of that kind of data? And what if you keep doing the experiment and you keep seeing data like that? How do you make the call that the data is what you were predicting and therefore supports your experimental or hypothesis or more accurately doesn't disprove it versus looking at the difference between observed and expected and, and knowing or being able to state confidently that it's too great and that in fact there is something going on here and that maybe your original experimental hypothesis needs to be reframed. So we're asking the question then, is the difference between observed and expected data something you'd see by chance alone? And if so, what's the probability of seeing that difference by chance alone? This is framing something called a statistical null hypothesis. So the chi-square goodness of fit test is great in these circumstances. It's good at helping you get numbers to evaluate the difference between observed and expected data. And by numbers I mean it'll give you a probability that the difference between observed and expected is due to chance alone. So if the probability, or if the difference between, I'm sorry, if the probability that the difference between observed and expected um, has been measured, right, and you have some numbers for it, how do you deal with those numbers? So, like, what if the number is, like, 20%, like, there's a 20% chance that the difference between observed and expected that you're seeing is due to chance alone. In other words, you know, you'd expect to see that big of a difference 20% of the time on average. Well, that's 
that's pretty good, right? Like that's like that's a big chance that like that difference is just due to chance alone. Like that's that's really good, right? What if on the other hand the number was 0.1%? I'm feeling like that's too tiny, right? Like 0.1% or 1% feels really small to me. I I'm not going to be comfortable that I saw that difference if there's such a tiny chance that you should see that difference if the explanation for the difference is chance alone. And I realize this stuff is a little wordy, guys. So what's the what's the number? Like we need to have a number whereby to say, okay, we're comfortable with that probability. We're going to accept that the difference between observed and expected is due to chance alone. And therefore, we we fail to reject the null statistical hypothesis. And we do not reject our experimental hypothesis. In other words, you know, it, it's generally supported here. It turns out that we like the number 5% in science. And this has been validated. It's not just a random number people chose out of a hat. A lot of statisticians, statisticians have done a lot of work on that number. So there's, there's good data to support the use of 5% as a, as a critical value or a threshold for the p-values in chi-square goodness of fit test. So if we see a p value that is 5% or greater, then we accept that as not disproving the statistical null hypothesis, which is the difference between observed and expected is due to chance alone, and therefore not disproving the experimental hypothesis. If the p value on the other hand is less than 5%, then we reject the null statistical hypothesis and we say that the data fail to support our experimental hypothesis. In other words, we should question the data. And the first thing you would do would be to repeat the experiments, ideally with a larger sample size, and see if you see similar data and analyze it again. If you continued to see that um, the experimental hypothesis was not supported, then you would move on and question the experimental hypothesis and develop a different hypothesis. Change your science. So the p-values, are, can be calculated using, um, using software, using programs, but it's also really common to look them up using a table. And this font in this is a little bit small, but your reading has one that you can look at as well. The p-values are given across the top. So 0 0.001 here is a p-value, 0.3 is a p-value, 0.95 is a p-value, this would be 95%, right? 50%, 30%, and so on, right? And over here is our 0.05, and the star down here is showing us that this is that threshold p-value. Now looking at this, um, you should realize that you need a couple of other pieces of information in order to find the p-value, or more accurately, the range of p-values that you are going to be working with experimentally. So specifically, you need to know something called the degrees of freedom for your experiment, and then you also need to know the chi-square value. So the chi-square value is like all, all these numbers in here, but more accurately, yours will be probably something that like falls between two numbers that won't exactly hit one of these numbers or the other, but it'll be between two numbers. The degrees of freedom is this column here. So how do you get those, right? So first, the simple one. Degrees of freedom, when you're looking at categorical data, which is what we use chi-squared analysis on, degrees of freedom can be calculated by saying, what is the number of data categories? In Mendelian genetics, that means the number of phenotypes usually, minus one, and that whatever you get from that is the degrees of freedom. So for our plant height example, there are two heights that we're considering, short and tall. Therefore, two categories of data, minus one, equals one degree of freedom. Another way of thinking about that is that if you know how many short plants you've got and you know the total, you can determine the number of tall plants by, by simple subtraction, right? So, and that's actually what the degrees of freedom refers to. In a dihybrid cross, if you were doing a test cross on a presumed heterozygote, you would have four categories of data and then four minus one would give you three as your degrees of freedom. So that's what I was just asking you guys to calculate here, and then I got ahead of myself a little bit. So we threw, let's th say we threw another trade in, and we weren't just tracking plant height, but also flower color. 
we were saying you've got your A gene for height. Let's say there's a B gene for flower color on the same plant. And this is a, the heterozygote. And let's say instead of a test cross, you look at the F2. So you would get that by mating these two F1s. And then you would expect in the F2 generation to see a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotype ratio. And you would see four different phenotypes. So you'd see three degrees of freedom when you were looking at the chi-squared calculation for that. How do you get the chi-squared value itself? Well, there's some, that's some pretty basic number crunching, although students always seem to think that like after they do all this work, they should just be all done. But what I'm pointing out to you is that, yeah, you do a bunch of work with this, but it's some pretty, it's not even math, it's just simple numeracy. And if you, once you do that carefully, then what you get is a chi-squared value, and it feeds into figuring out what the probability is that is associated with this chi-squared goodness of fit analysis, right? It's just one of the steps along the way. So to get a chi-squared value, this table shows you a way to set up that kind of calculation or number crunching. You take a column and you write down your phenotypes or your data classes. For the plant height example, there'd just be two, right? But here, this is a dihybrid cross that I was analyzing at one time, so it's four. You take all the observed data that you count from your experiment, you write those numbers in here, and then you sum them, and that's really important to get a total. The total number of progeny was 100 here, okay? And then from that, then you move on and you have to calculate your expected data. And this is something that can mess students up a little bit, right? So how do you get the expected data? Well, looking at this, I remember that this was an analysis where I was looking at a dihybrid cross, and I was looking at peas, and I was looking at pea color and pea shape and some data around that. And I set this up so that the yellow round is the dominant dominant category, yellow wrinkled, and green round were the dominant recessive, recessive dominant categories, and then wrinkled green seeds were fully recessive at both loci. Okay, so there should be a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio in those offspring. And I know that because I know how to do dihybrid crosses, okay? And there are 100 total. So 9 over 16 times 100 gives me this 56.25. 3 over 16 times 100 gives me 18.75. The same is true here. And then 1 over 16, that what I would expect for this recessive-recessive phenotype category, times 100 gives me 6.25. How do I know if I made a mistake? I sum all of those and I should get to 100 and I check that the two totals are the same. Yes, you can make mistakes in that, but it's not hard. Like the number crunching is not hard. So you just have to practice it to get good at it. Once you have this data, then in the next column, you take the difference between observed and expected. So you take this value and you subtract this value and then take that all the way down the column you'll get a few negative numbers in there, no doubt, which is why in the next column we square that difference, and that's what goes here. And then in the last column, we take that difference squared and we divide it by the expected data, okay? This is a place where people frequently make a mistake. They put the wrong number in as the denominator here. So it's the difference squared divided by the expected value. So 7.5625 divided by 56.25, and that gives me 0 0.134444. And I never round till the very end of these calculations, and neither should you. So that's how I got each of these values here. And then I do the very last thing for this part of the analysis, and that is that I sum this column, those four values, and that's the chi-squared test. Okay, so now with this chi-squared test, I can go back to that table and I can get the range of p-values, okay? So I have the chi-squared value, I need the degrees of freedom, there are four data categories, 4 minus 1 is 3, so degrees of freedom is 3, chi-squared value is there, and I can go back to that table and it's like 2.25, the degrees of freedom is 3, that's this row here, I had 2.45 which would fall somewhere in here, so I can say that my p-value is, going up here, it is greater than 
and smaller than 0.5. So it is between 30 and 50%. It is way bigger than this 5% value. Therefore, I would fail to reject the null hypothesis, fail to reject my experimental hypothesis. It's pretty good data. It definitely supports my, my ideas or my thinking about that experimental system. You could do a chi-squared analysis on the data that we looked at earlier, and you would set it up in the same way. There are the two phenotype categories. There's the observed data, sums to 200. The expected data sums to 200. And here, this was a test cross, right? That's why these numbers are the same. This previous example, that was the F2 generation from a dihybrid cross. 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 is what you expect there. Difference in pattern here, okay? Test crosses, 1 to 1 if it's a monohybrid system. So there, that's why it's 100 and 100. What's the difference between observed and expected? 25 and 25. It's negative in this case. There's the square, okay? And then uh, the difference divided by the expected, 6.25 and 6.25. 12.5 is my, um, my chi-squared value. What's my degree of freedom? Well, two categories of data, minus one is one. So a degree of freedom of one, a chi-squared value of 12.5. And let me take you back to, so we're up here in this top, top, top row, and we said 12.5, right? And that takes us way over here, right? Whoa, we fell like right off this table. So all I can say is that the chi-squared value is less than 0 0.001, or less than 0.1%. That's way over there in the reject zone. This stinks, right? So my data definitely mean that I have to reject the null hypothesis, and it does not support my experimental hypothesis. So what do I do next? We already did that, we did that. Um, I am going to have to... I'm going to have to redo the experiment, collect more data, and then if I still keep seeing the same patterns, I'm going to know that there's a different genetic story at play, and I'm going to have to question what that is. And so I might have a situation where I have incomplete dominance, where I don't really understand the relationship between the two alleles. Maybe there's an additional gene at work. Maybe there's some sort of environmental factor influencing things. Maybe one of the alleles is lethal, so I'm not getting full counts in one of the phenotype categories. Maybe sex linkage is playing a row. I don't know, but I'm going to have to look for other explanations. And that concludes this video lecture on the use of chi-square in uh, simple genetic problems. Chi-square goodness of fit.